What's going on, good people? Rich here. School in the building. What's happening? Hey, everybody. It's your girl, Ray P. And we're back at it again with another episode of the Culture Garden Podcast. We definitely appreciate y'all tuning in. We have a special guest with us this episode. Culture Garden family. At this Legend. point, Brian, I, I don't know if you're aware of this. By far, the most featured guest on the Culture Garden. This is your fourth appearance. I said this is four, right? Yeah, yep. this is number four. Okay. It's number four for you, man. Welcome back to Brian. Appreciate yeah. you coming on. No, thank you, guys. Yes. Yeah, yeah, man. Excited to uh, actually want to give you a shout out for your happy, happy anniversary to you. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Everybody listening, feel how you want to feel about that. Um, <laughs> Brian's recording on his anniversary with us. Shout out to Kelly. Um, you know, it's a lovely bride. I was uh, I was happy to be a part of their wedding day. I was in the wedding. Um, my favorite my favorite memory from that weekend was being in Brian's apartment and me, you know, having my medicine with me. And Brian just busting in the room like, "What's going on? Like, what are you doing?" Like with that same tone, because it was so loud that it came through the whole apartment. And he oh just opened that door like, "What's going on?" Like, what's going on here? It was like a Bob Marley concert in there. Um. Oh, man. oh, man. Just the, oh, I wish somebody would have recorded that natural. Just, it was more concerned than anything. Like, yo, are you, you good? Like, what's going on here? These taxes are rented. Happy anniversary to you. Um, school, school's guilty pleasures. Yes, yes, yeah. Another episode will come in next week. So Culture Garden won't be back next week because it's Thanksgiving week, but School's Guilty Pleasure will be dropping an episode and on Thanksgiving Day. Like I said, Thanksgiving morning. That's trying right. to find something to do with the family that you don't really like. Hey, get, hey, got episode. something real special for uh for all the stepdaddies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a Thanksgiving slash stepdad type of movie. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll get back to y'all. Ray P. Yes. We got y'all this back. <laughs> we releasing this weekend. All right. We got you. We promise we got you. <laughs> now, I'm going to take the L for this one. My schedule has been all over the place and crazy. Um, but Rachel and myself already got it ironed out. Recording schedule. We got it. Rap shit's coming. I promise you. I promise y'all. Subscribe to the feed. Turn it back on. Do what you need to do. <laughs> yeah. Now, please remember to like, subscribe, share. All the information is in our link tree, which is in our bio and in this episode description. There will be spoilers and explicit content this episode, and you can already tell by the title we are going to be discussing American Gangster. Yes. The synopsis of the film, an outcast New York City cop is charged with bringing down Harlem drug lord Frank Lucas, whose real life inspired this partly biographical film. As far as the stats go, this film was released November 2nd, 2007, directed by Sir Ridley Scott, Obviously, he directed Gladiator, The Martian, Thelma and Louise, <laughs> G.I. Jane. So he might be partly responsible for, you know, the Oscars fiasco and Matchstick Man, which is one of my favorites. Um, yeah. I don't know if anybody here has seen Matchstick Man, but that's definitely one of mine. It was written by Steve Zalen, uh, who also wrote Schindler, Schindler's List, Mission Impossible, Gangs of New York, Moneyball, The Irishman, the limited series, The Night Of, just has an extensive resume when it comes to writing. Nice. Um, and Mr. Jacobson had a budget of an estimated $100 million and made $269.7 million worldwide, 43 and a half opening weekend, which was the largest open for Denzel and Russell Crowe at that point of their careers. And this film is currently streaming on Max. As far as awards goes, 38 nominations, 12 wins. Um, as far as big ones, nominated for two Oscars. You have Best Performance by an Actress in a Supporting Role for Ruby D. Um, she also was nominated for a SAG Award and an Image Award in the same category. Um, and also the Oscar for Best Achievement in Art Direction for Arthur Max and Beth A. Rubino. Um, was also nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Picture in 2008. Denzel and Ridley Scott were also nominated for Best Actor and Best Director at the Golden Globes. And it did win the Image Award for Best Picture and Outstanding Writing. Man. <sighs> Bear with me, y'all. The cast, man. The cast. So, Hotel. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So real quick before you get into that, because I, I told you guys I had a question for you. My question was, did Denzel get snubbed this year? Yes. Is is Denzel at the point of a Meryl Streep? Like, no matter what he stars in, he should be nominated? 
for this. I mean, movie. he would be okay, equalizer, maybe not the equalizer, but if it if it's he's acting like he should be nominated. Period. Yeah, in a film okay. like this. Yeah, definitely. All right, that's it. Ray P, what you think? You got anything? Um, in a film like this, yes, but uh, I didn't love Roman J. Israel, so I I don't know if that was nomination worthy of anything. As far mm. as it was different, it was different. <laughs> but you, but for Denzel, you want something different, like yeah, I, I think it different. Was great. So I didn't. He did well, I guess, for what it was. Which I've seen the movie several times and still can't tell you. Yeah. What it is that I actually watched. Um, <laughs> Me too. But, <laughs> Denzel, man. Yeah. So maybe not for everything, but for roles that are significant, then yeah, I think he is at that Meryl level. Okay. I'm I think gonna... majority, if you, I don't know what the percentage of Meryl's nomination toward films, but it should be on that equal one every three, four films, I guess. Yeah. You know, maybe two out of four. Um, he should probably be nominated for if he chooses those projects because he also has two guns and shit like that under his belt, uh, which you can't really even taking the pedal one two three, which is a, I guess a star movie with him and John, John Travolta. Like that's not a Oscar worthy. So you know he he has fun with it. He enjoys the art of acting. I have another question in the vein of questions. So if you guys remember two thousand seven, there was a real conversation about who was a better actor between. Denzel Washington and Russell Crowe. Does anybody kind of remember that small audience that had that conversation? Absolutely. No. No, I don't you either. Don't. You don't? That was a small... All right, so when you look at... This is the first time a small audience. Really? Yeah. No, that was that was a one... That was a part of... I heard this too much for my liking Yep. around the time of the film. Like it was part of the buildup because of the 2000 run that Russell Crowe had. He had won an Oscar like maybe a year after Denzel. He had Gladiator. He had A Beautiful Mind. He had Cinderella Man. He had You Know 310. All of that from 2000 up to this film. So he was like a hot guy in Hollywood. He was he was on his run. He, that, this was his best part of his career. And at the time of this film, I'm not saying he was a better actor, but they were saying like, "Oh man, who's gonna really win the who's gonna win the film between them?" And I thought it was a ridiculous argument because that's Denzel Washington. Absolutely. Without question, school, you remember that, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's why I'm. Yeah, I definitely. Remember. I thought it was ridiculous, but it was a real conversation, and yeah. I thought it was crazy. He would. I mean, credit to Russell. He was on a hell of a run. Like we, we can't knock that. But you're not fucking with Denzel, bro. Like it ain't yeah. even. It ain't ever. happening. Ever, ever. Um, as far as the cast, Denzel Washington is Frank Lucas. We have Russell Crowe as Richie Roberts. The other first choice is Brad Pitt. Yeah. I can't really see. I think Russell Crowe was probably the best fit at this time. Um, this I is the second film. You can kind of see Brad. Kind of see Brad. I can see I can see Brad Pitt now more than, than in 07. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like I feel in my like head, I He's opened up his repertoire a little bit more now, but in 07, absolutely not. Well, I think this would have done it, though. Okay. I can see that. I yeah. think it's tough because the way the movie looks, it's so disgustingly New York in the 60s and 70s, which is like a hellscape. Yeah. I can't picture Brad Pitt being in an environment like that and doing that. Like, I think... Russell Crowe fits it perfectly. He's like not like traditionally handsome. He's kind of pudgy and like he's like real doughy in this movie. Mm-hmm. Like the scene that's my favorite is when he's lifting weights and it's like, dude, come on, you're like you're you're pretty doughy right now. Um, and it just I think he fits it, you know, pretty perfectly what you would expect a cop in New York in the late sixties and early seventies being. Mm-hmm. I can feel that. I hear that. I hear that. Now. Well, I, there's another name that we'll have in a second. You told me Brad Pitt is Trupo. I think you got it. I can 100% see that. I can see that even more. Yeah. 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 I think that's it. I think he can. And, and um, John, Roland, I mean, there's not enough to say about him. In this film, you want to talk about runs. We talked about that in um, uh, No Country for Old Men, just the 07 that he had. Yeah, mm-hmm. but Brad Pitt is, is, is Trupo. 
I can really picture that like immediately. Yeah. Immediately. Are you guys only having me on for the Brolin episodes? I guess so. <laughs> All right. I'm official official Brolin um representative. Uh no, you did uh drumline. I did do drumline. Yeah, you did house party, man. Yeah, you did house party. party. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. That's still funny. But I've done two Brolin movies now too, so now it's gotta be a thing. Um, we also have the second movie between Crow and Denzel. Virtuosity came out, I believe, in 95. Roles were switched. In that film, Denzel was the cop and Russell Crowe was the bad guy. Uh, rounding out the cast as well, we have Ruby D, the incredible, the legendary, the not enough adjectives to really describe her. Ruby D as Mama Lucas, Chua Tella Jua for as Huey Lucas, Josh Brolin as Detective Trupo. All right, I got to stop for a second. I know I mentioned Brad Pitt, but... Does anybody know who was offered this role and turned it down? And I haven't stopped thinking about it since I read it. No. No. James Gandolfini. Mm. It's not the same as Brolin or Pitt, yeah. but it's just as good, if not better. But it's still good. Damn. It'll still be good, yeah. That's really good. Yes. Yeah. He had the role, he turned it down. Probably because he's still filming Sopranos at this time, or maybe just wrapped up. Typecast, I get it. Mm -hmm. um, even though cop and that's the whole thing, but the tough guy image, I get it. But uh, yeah, that would be. Oh, that would have been interesting. That would have been a very interesting portrayal. Um, Lamari Nadal is Eva. Ruben Santiago Hudson is Doc. Ted Levine as Lou Toback, that school's guy. Yeah. Roger Jember Smith. I struggled a couple episodes ago trying to remember how to say his name. Robert Jenver Strick Smith, excuse me, as Nate. John Hawks as Freddie Spearman. Rizza as Moses. Malcolm Goodwin as Jimmy Z or Jimmy Lee. John Ortiz as Javier J. Rivera, which was uh, Richie Roberts' partner. Cuba Gooding Jr. as Nicky Barnes and Armand Asante as Dominic Catano. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that and things about Cuba Gooding Jr. playing himself. Um... <laughs> Why this movie? This was a collab episode. Nobody really chose it. Long story short, four Oscar winners, mm -hmm. four Oscar nominees. Mm -hmm. You got Denzel, you got Russell Crowe, you got Ruby D. Uh, Chua tells Jewel for whatever you want to say. This is an incredible acted movie. Yep. Yeah, Josh Brolin, incredibly acted movie. From my personal standpoint, and I'll get your guys' opinion, it's a very complex film to tell. Like, this is a very complicated story to tell and shoot. And the mm -hmm. way it came out on screen was phenomenal. And I yeah. have to give all the credit to Ridley Scott for that. All the shots and all the different technical aspects, when you look at it on paper, it's almost an impossible feat. There were 135 speaking parts in this film in 380 locations. Or 360, excuse me. Oh, 135 wow. people spoke in this film. That's insane. That's unheard of numbers. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So to put all of that into a two and a half hour movie, and I've said it on episodes past, there are a lot of times where I say, man, I would have loved for that to be a miniseries or for me to get a little bit more information. I think I got everything I wanted out of this story. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I feel like I left that theater two and a half hours. I don't necessarily need to know a ton more about Frank Lucas. I don't need to know more about Richie. That was cool. I enjoyed it. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, so I, I appreciate the film for that that manner and that's why I'm so excited to talk about it. Yeah, that comes out now. That's that's seven episodes, eight episodes. Yeah, for, right? sure. for sure. Yeah. Easy. Easy. So Brian, I'll ask you first. Classic or not? Uh, absolutely. This is my favorite Denzel movie. Um, mm. and I for me I don't know if it's close. I, I watched this movie again this afternoon while I was working from home. Um and it <laughs> There's still parts of this movie that I absolutely love. I the first time I saw it was on like a bootleg DVD of it that my dad made me, um, which was great. Um, and it's just how the movie starts. You're like, oh shit, okay, Denzel's like he's a bad dude in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, love it. Love all the performances. Um, yeah, by far my favorite Denzel movie. Mm. Right, Pete. What about you? Uh, definitely a classic. It's in my top five Denzel movies. Um, I'm not sure it's number one, but it's definitely in my top five um, and definitely a classic. 
For sure. School, what you got? And I'm going to have to agree with Ray P on this one. Uh, definitely top five, Denzel. Man, number one, sheesh. It's, it's between this and training day, though, so I guess it's top two. Shit, I don't know. It just, just depends on the day. <laughs> so here's my question for you real fast to, to bounce off of that. When you say training day, do you think training day is a better movie? Or oh, time out. Say this conversation. I've got, I've got us. Sorry. We're going to have this conversation. <laughs> going to have this conversation. Trust me. Um, it is definitely classic. I, I think that's a no-brainer. I don't know where it stands. I think Denzel's resume is so extensive that that's something I would want to really stop and think about. Because he has, he has great movies that you don't even think about on your first Denzel thought. That mm-hmm. makes sense. See, I agree. Um, I agree with that. But there's something about bad guy Denzel. Like it's no, yeah, for sure, for sure. Because you can put, but he's he has a lot of good bad guy roles as well. And I don't know. I have another question that we'll get to about Denzel that that'll mesh with the whole training day conversation. Um, but obvious classic. I don't think anybody can really question that. What's up, sure. right? You about to say something? No, I was in agreement. Oh, my bad. My bad. My bad. My bad. Better than the last movie. This the is interesting inkwell? because they are, yep, they are different genres. Is it better than the Inkwell? Yes. Yes, but they're so different, there would be no reason to compare them yeah. other than True. this discussion. Agreed. True. Agreed. That's, uh, that's why I like the randomness of this. Mm-hmm. It's because it makes you think on that. I'm going uh, I'm going American Gangster. I'm going American Gangster. Origin of this film, just because I had an interesting start. This started from a New York Times article by a gentleman of the name of Mark Jacobson. He had an article titled Return of the Superfly, which was obviously about the rise and fall of Frank Lucas in the 70s. Uh, Universal Pictures and Imagine Entertainment read that article and said, we want to buy the rights to this because we want to make it a movie, obviously. Drugs, crime, it all sells. In 2002, Steve Zalen wrote a script. He gave it to uh, Ridley Scott, who decided to do other things. Nick Pileggi. Uh, which this is an interesting fact. Nick Pilecki, he wrote Casino Goodfellas. He came to uh, Zayman and he asked him if he wanted to meet Frank Lucas. This is how he even got involved in the project. Um, he's, he was a crime reporter in the 70s and he ended up covering Frank Lucas' trial and built a relationship with him. Uh, the three of them met and Frank Lucas kept mentioning Richie, this guy, Richie Roberts, Richie Roberts, to the point where Steve was like, hey, can we meet this Richie Roberts guy? He got flown in. They ended up meeting at like one of the Regency Hotel in New York City for about four hours. And that's when Steve realized, like, I need to tell this story. But I also I'm kind of fucked because I don't know how to tell the story because there's two. There are literally two different stories. Like, can I make one movie? There was thoughts of having two separate movies, one about Richie and one about Frank. Uh, but they ended up trying to find a way to intertwine. intertwine. Yeah, intertwine the, the scripts. And obviously we got the end result. But before they even did that. In 2004, Antoine Fuqua was approached to direct it with Denzel starring. Um, Benicio Del Toro was set to play Richie. Hmm. And they both had yeah, I don't know if I see that. But I can I can see it, but nah. Hmm. They both had paid play contracts. Mm-hmm. So for those who don't know, I can pay whether this film get made or not. So Denzel got paid 20 million, Benicio got five, the film never got made. And John Fuqua and the studio had creative differences, small, not small stuff, but principal stuff. He, Antoine wanted to shoot it in New York City. Studio said, now nah, let's shoot it in Toronto. We can get the same kind of look. It was a whole bunch of stuff like that. They ended up firing him. And then they brought it to Pete Berg with the blessing of Denzel. Um, and he passed on it. And they had to go ahead and pay Denzel and Benicio their money. Came back to Ridley Scott in 2006. He had time to do with this, uh, this go round. And the rest, as they say, is history. We finally yeah. got American Gangster. So seven-year project to get it off the ground. Mm. As far as first experiences go, school, do you remember your first time seeing this film? Uh, Yeah, my first time seeing it was uh, the same sentiments as uh, Brian. Uh, met up with my bootleg man. And, uh, got a good, clear <laughs> version of this. And it was amazing. And then I went to the theater. So I saw it. I saw it first, DVD. Then I had to go to the theater, get the experience for sure. So that was it. <laughs> okay, then. Right, P? Um, I actually saw this for the first time at the Kappa House. 
Um, I'm not sure if it was a legitimate copy or if it was a bootleg. <laughs> but uh, shout yeah. out to Terry Green. <laughs> shout out to Terry Green, man. Um, so yeah, that's crazy. It's funny. I have a similar experience, but it's different. Mm -hmm. Shout out to shout out to Pierre, man. My dog, my family. Me and Pierre were living in Campus Village. Mm -hmm. We had, and Pierre is the fellow cinephile. Maybe one day he'll jump on the culture guard. He loves movies the same way. But that's all we did in college. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this movie for a while. That's back when you had to really search like these internet like pages and get updates on what films are coming out. Um, and he came home one day from the barbershop. And he had a bootleg copy of American Gangster. He sat there in the living room. He put it in. And we saw that first scene that Brian talked about. Mm -hmm. Denzel lighting this guy on fire, shooting him. And we both looked at each other. It's like it's, it's like a movie, y'all. We both looked at each other and said, nah, we're going to the theater to see this. We didn't finish it. We stopped that scene right there. Oh, me and him God. bought tickets. Me and him bought tickets to the opening night, Franklin Park. The theater was so packed. We had to sit in the front section. Dang. Like, I would never forget walking in the theater. And oh, we weren't God. super late. Like, we were there before previews. That theater was packed to see that movie. Mm -hmm. We sat in that front section to the left side. I'll never forget it. Uh, and we sat there for two and a half hours and just had one of those experiences with this film. It was everything that we hoped it would be. It was a complex story. One of those stories that you appreciate more as you get older and you're yep. not just into the action. Mm -hmm. you know. But when you look at, like I said, I never really appreciated how Ridley Scott even shot this film back yeah. in 2007 compared to the way I do now. Um, so I'll never forget that experience. That's one of those rare no matter how long I'm breathing, I'm always going to remember the first time I've seen American Gangster in that story before because we literally looked at each other like, nah, we can't do this. <laughs> so we got to go see this. Movie. Um, you know what's crazy? In my rewatch of this, I've seen American Gangster several times and I don't know why that whole intro montage, it was like I had never seen it before. I'm like, when did all of this happen? I've seen this movie start to finish a million times, and I was so confused. I'm like, damn, what the hell did that happen? <laughs> I, 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 I think that's because it happens so quick. Like, it's it's one of them, if you blink, you'll miss it type of scenes. I don't know. That's yeah, because that's before the credits. Like, that pops yeah. on. Right. And I and shout out to Ridley Scott, because I feel that that, that scene was definitely necessary Mm -hmm. To let you know Denzel isn't Denzel in this movie. This ain't that Denzel. So that was definitely needed. The crazy thing, it wasn't intended to be the opening of the film. Okay. It was they shot it for something else and it just happened to test well with audiences. Mm -hmm. And they decided, you know what, let's move this to the front and just they didn't they were struggling with a way to open the film. How do we even start telling this story? And then that was their way to do it and ease everybody into it. And like you guys said, it was a perfect way of showing. Right off the jump, within the first 10 seconds, yep. I know what type of guy Denzel is. And off his fame from training day for playing Alonzo, mm -hmm. the rest of the say was history. But it's good um, because in that scene, you know, he does what he does. But then he's really calm for the next 45 minutes. Yeah. And you're just like, okay, like, you know, we'll see. Maybe maybe there was a misunderstanding. Um, <laughs> what I wonder what happened with that guy because he's like, everybody's kind of shitting on him at the funeral and you're waiting and you're waiting until it eventually gets to the scene that I'm sure we'll all talk about here in a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, they do a great job of, of dialing that up and then dialing it back real fast. Mm -hmm. So I had a question, but I think based on, you know, Brian, you and Rachel, your answers already, I think I kind of know it. I was going to ask if this was his best film of the decade from 2000 to 2009, American Gangster, because he has a good, let me ask you guys a different way. Do you think the 2000s were his best decade of films? Um, what do you think it would be the 90s? Do you need me to run a couple films off? Uh, yeah, I would have to really sit and think about the All right. film. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me highlight some of what he did in the 90s, and then I'll do it for the 2000s. Mo Better Blues. Classic. Malcolm X. Classic. Elegant Brief. Classic. Philadelphia. Classic. Crimson Tide. Devil in a Blue Dress. 
Mm-hmm. Courage on the Fire, Preacher's Wife. Classic. He Got Game. Classic. Bone Collector, Hurricane. Classic. Those are all from 90 to 99. Okay. I forgot Ricochet. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be on SGP. Don't worry about it. <laughs> that's, that's I will guest on that one. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. I love Ricochet. Much more than I should. Man. As far as these 2000s. Hold on. Here's the 2000s. Remember the Titans. Classic. Training Day. Classic. John Q. Classic. Antoine Fisher. Classic. Out of Time. Classic. Man on Fire. Classic. Manchurian Candidate. Classic. Hey, P, I'm going to say classic for you. Inside Man. Classic. Classic. <laughs> so good. Deja Vu. Classic. American Gangster. Classic. Great Debaters. Classic. The Taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3. Okay. Mm, that's a tough, that's a man. That's so a, the difference is there was more movies in the 2000s than the 90s. So man. I guess by default and majority of those are all amazing, amazing films I, and performances. So for volume sake, I guess, yes. For me. 2000s. 2000s is when he stamped. It was the stamp, man. Like 2000s for sure. Yeah. Can you? It's so tough to compare because the movies are like a lot different. Yeah. Yeah. Like his 90s. His 90s, he's like with things like Philadelphia, Malcolm X, Ricochet, he's really going after like those super dramatic great roles right mm-hmm. and then the 2000s hit and he's doing a lot of just like big fucking movies yeah he's doing training day remember the titans was huge man on fire is fantastic um deja vu book of eli which barely makes it the cut there but like that it's it's tough i i feel like the 2000s has more like characters like yeah. he 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 stamped these characters we know Denzel for are from the 2000s. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's where I don't know, we, we can save that conversation for an actual Denzel episode. I don't want to get too deep into it. Um, the people who say Denzel just plays Denzel every movie. Nah, they crazy. Because there's an audience that says that. There, there is an audience that says that, but I think a lot of it is the tonal quality of his voice. Like, mm-hmm. it is, I think that's it because, and I think that's really just it. You always know it's Denzel when you're charming, you're charming, exactly. And, and even like, his authoritative voice, it's still you know that that is Denzel. There's so, times in mm-hmm. this movie where you're like, oh man, this dude's fucking awesome, right? Like, just some of the things he says, the way he looks when he says it, it's like mm-hmm. my man. Yeah. <laughs> there, there I don't say this a lot at all. Um, because I'm very happy being me. Denzel's one of those few people where he does certain things on screen where I, I stop for a second, like, man, I wish I was that guy. Mm-hmm. I wish I could deliver that like that or be that like what? I, <laughs> just be that cool. <laughs> And I'm a cool, yeah. I'm a cool motherfucker. Yeah. yeah. Listen. But that he just, I don't know. It's it just, and, and I, like I said, it's it's rare for me and it's easy to point out because I never, I rarely look at anybody and just say, oh yeah, I want to be that. I would, I would be like Denzel, like easily, no question of that. Not just because of his accolades and but just a cool, just a cool person. Yeah. Okay. What are you gonna say, school? My bad. Nah, I, I was gonna totally agree with you. It, it's just it's something about Denzel and the way he he does things and carries himself. And not to not to jump in the scenes, but you know the 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 scene where he's talking to his brother about that suit that he had on and just like how he grabbed him was like I would kill you if you want. Like just like you, I know he's joking, but he's serious. Like I appreciate yeah. people who's not with the shits, like they or with the shits. However you want to say it, they they not here for the bullshit like i'm yep. here for a specific reason i'm not here to play with you don't mm-hmm. i'm not here for none of that real quick before we get into the next thing i think it was steve zan ridley scott one of them said um denzel turned into frank lucas on set 
um, okay. to this whole point about Denzel plays the same. Denzel plays Denzel all over the place. Mm -hmm. They all knew Frank Lucas. They met Frank Lucas, and they said, "I looked at Denzel, and that was I saw Frank Lucas. I didn't see Denzel Washington." And that goes. They wanted to credit him for the homework and the work that he puts into his craft. I know we look at it, um, and Ridley Scott said this great on the, the DVD commentary. Um, he he kind of tongue in cheek had a way of saying, "You know, I'm a." 40 year career overnight success. Denzel is a, you know, 30 year career overnight. People look at these stars and look at them for the stars they are now, but don't look at brick by brick, every film, every role, every day, they do something to their craft to the point where they can, you know, embody somebody like Frank Lucas and people say, okay, man, like this guy's for real. Not only is he a legend, but he still puts in the work. He outworking everybody in this room. And I thought that was incredible about him. So Denzel, I mean, he's a go. All right. Yes. Best scenes. Let's get into it. Brian, you're a guest. We'll let you lead this thing off. Um, it's when he shoots Tango on the street. I'll start there. Okay. That, mm, just jumping that, right to it, huh? Yeah, like that scene right there is. I've seen this movie 20 times, 25, 30 times, and that scene mm -hmm. still. Every time it happens, it makes me jump back a little bit because it's, I know it's coming, but it's still so, it's such a violent scene in one act that it's just like, oh shit, this is, this is the guy we saw from the first scene of the movie, right? Like this, and it's, it's a great scene. Yeah. The amount of shit that he was talking to him and it's just, what are you going to shoot me right here on the street? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It didn't say a word. It's very interesting that you have that because my first scene is the first scene between Frank and Tango. That's on my list, yeah. Funeral, just because we know that, you know, he was Bumpy's driver and he was essentially low man on the totem pole in consideration of all the other dope, dope boys or dealers back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and so just how Tango was trying to sun him and, you know, while you're at it, go get me a lighter. Yeah, like exactly, exactly. And my how mm -hmm. the tides change. So definitely go scenes. They said that. Go ahead, school. No, I was gonna say definitely. I, I agree 110% that man, Tango only knows you know Frank as Bumpy's driver, and Bumpy's no longer here. Just that reiteration of Bumpy's dead, nigga. Like, like who are you? You are nobody here. Like. And and back to what you were saying, th those 45 minutes of, of of Frank Lucas being calm. So mm -hmm. we as viewers don't know how he is going to react. Like, how is he going to deal with this tango situation? And and he 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 did it just how we he deals with it. Yeah. Yep. In front of his brother who did not know who and what he was on. Like, yeah. Well, even before that, even when the one Rachel brought up that scene when tango was talking about the 20 percent that Frank wasn't, to your point, school, Frank wasn't a boss or anybody you were really watching for or checking for in New York. Yeah. So when you had somebody like Tango come in, he didn't say two words in that whole conversation. He let Tango do all the talking. He went about his business, wiping his hand, pouring his sugar in his coffee, like pretty much acting like you're not even here to me. Like, I'm not even concerned about you because you were, you were about to be off the board anyway. Um, <laughs> so that just sign of it, the way he carried it, just, he says it in the film. The loudest one in the room is the weakest in the room. He yeah. was never loud about his business. I mean everything I'm going to say. I'm not, this is your one time. Yep. Next time there to, to, to quote the Sopranos. Next time there will be a, there won't be a next time. That like, that's just what it is. Um, the scene that I'm going to go with before that will switch it from Frank. I want to go to Richie and the turn it into million dollars. Okay. Hey, <laughs> I think I can. I think it's safe to say nobody here. I think we're all stand up citizens. Y'all turning in a million dollars? Not in 1968 in New York. <laughs> right. Unmarked and unmarked cash? No. No. Nah. You got your mind if you think I'm turning in a million dollars of unmarked cash. Okay. Get crazy. Your mind. Just for okay. in case there were eyes, I might turn in 20,000. Yeah, you do. You have to. You have to give it to something. Look, we found this. We found this. You, you ain't gonna tell on if you, if that's your money. You're not gonna tell on me to tell on you. 
Exactly. Right. Let's say there's more. So mm -hmm. I know I'm getting away with this. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, kill me. you ain't gonna kill no cop. You definitely ain't turning in nine hundred and eighty seven thousand dollars though. <laughs> I don't know what kind of noble I don't know how noble I'm a noble dude. You get what I'm saying? I've I've went back to graders once and paid for a shake because they forgot to charge me. Mm -hmm. I'm that type of guy, right? I know, right? Yeah, Rachel, I deserve real. that I wrote. It's it's same hero. Good. It's a real <laughs> hero. <same thing. laughs> Listen, it tells me sleep better at night. Mm -hmm. Save on the world one better. milkshake at a time. <laughs> My point is, fuck y'all. My point is, I'm not turning this money in, except for whatever I need to recover myself. Not in this but it also showed that if there's not a better character introduction of what this guy is like and where his morals are, then it's this scene right here. Yeah. And just the overall or stupidity. Is there? I don't know what motivates a decision like that because I don't. I don't think anybody's that morally near, uh, straight. Well, and that's the thing. You say we see where his morals lie. Like, okay, you're a good cop. You uphold the honor of the badge. But he's a shitty dad. He's yeah, a he's a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the so, moral fiber is thin. You know, yep, the morals are thin. So that, I, I don't know. Just, you're good at your job. Yep, that's that's, that's the that's point. Fair. That's the point I was going to make, Ray P, is like he had to have something that he stood on. You feel me? Because everything else he was slim on. You feel? Yeah. It was bad. So definitely. I also love the fact that in a occupation where you are expected to do the right thing, mm -hmm. and once again, use that word moral, do the morally correct thing, mm -hmm. um, everybody knows you cannot turn this money in. Mm hmm his partner Jay even told him, "Cops kill cops they can't trust." Yeah. If you turn in this money, it's over for it. So it, just that dynamic of looking at it from, this is the right thing to do. This is what you're expected to do, but everybody knows you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty much career suicide. Um, and that's a crazy dynamic to be in. But I'm not taking that money at all. At all, Brian. What you got for your next scene? Um, staying with Richie, him following the money into New York. Just his first little face off with Trupo is so good. Mm -hmm. Um, you just you start to realize that like Trupo's just a great bad guy. He's just <laughs> a piece of shit and just treats everybody like shit. And it's great. Like you can see Richie is like freaking out a little bit when he sees that they're cops. Mm -hmm. And he's like, fuck, I gotta chase after this and get this back. Yep. Um, it's just a great tense scene. Yeah. I go ahead, school. No, I was gonna say I agree. It, it uh, to the point where that man had to give out the serial number on the money. Yeah, <laughs> because if he wouldn't have, he wasn't getting that money. Cop or not, a cop or not, like, yeah. and he let him know if you come back here with more money, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> you ain't getting it back. Mm -hmm. Troop old, uh, old man. This is where Brolin. I wanted more. Well, I can't even say that because I think less is more for him. I think mm -hmm. every scene he had, he destroyed. But just the way he casually played the, when's the last time I've been to Jersey? Uh, that's right, never. Like, don't <laughs> ever come in the city unannounced. And you call it, I don't care if you want to see a Broadway show, you call ahead and make sure I'm okay with it. Just that tone of, fuck you. Like, mm -hmm. fuck you talking to? But you can't say that. Right. Which you that already do. And they looked like, go ahead, Ray. Not to say that typical New York versus New Jersey yeah. uh, was very much at play here in this scene. Go ahead. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Uh, Rachel, what you got for your next scene? Uh, I also had that. Uh, I'm sticking with Richie, too, and then we kind of touched on it earlier, but uh, Jay and Richie in the ambulance after uh, after Jay shot that crackhead in the uh, project, just <laughs> because in the scene, in our first introduction to John or Jay, I couldn't tell if he was dirty or what. But I knew that there was something up with him uh, and that he wasn't on the up and up. Truly, truly, truly. And then considering he didn't want to turn in the money. I initially first thought, like, is this his money? You know, <laughs> are you connected to this money in some form or fashion? But so now, OK, we know that you've been undercover, maybe. Um, and now you're questioning bad guys, doing all the things that Richie has taught you to do. But now you've turned into a fiend. Mm -hmm. And 
you're making mistakes and expecting your partner to help you who's taught you so much and who you know has this high quote unquote moral fiber. So if anybody is going to vouch for you and make sure the scene gets cleaned up, you know that it's going to be Richie. So um, just that turn of events in Richie, I think him also realizing for the first time that John is a junkie and this is not at all how you presented it. Fuck you, but I love you. <laughs> he was hurt. He was hurt when he saw his body laid out. Mm-hmm. He couldn't even look at it. He had to turn away because he yeah. I wonder how much of that and feel free to chime in. I wonder how much of that was am I somewhat responsible for mm-hmm. turning that money in? Would he have turned out like this if I had, or was this just who he was all the way? Yeah. So I think Something to think about. A couple of small scenes before I get into mine. I just want to mention them as we move along. Uh, one is Frank going over to Bangkok mm-hmm. just because the whole dynamic of that showing how disciplined and serious Frank was about cutting out the middleman and making all the profit. Mm-hmm. His business savvy and his business mind. Like I know exactly how we're going to, you know, go about this whole process. That obviously led in with Bumpy. When Bumpy had that scene at the beginning talking about, you know, got the middleman and you know what does America come to mm-hmm. I think that planted the seeds of that but it's a character trait as far as how he handles business yeah you have to ask getting gas you know how are you going to move them over here you ain't got to worry about that mm-hmm. you know who you work for you got to worry about that either like this is not what I'm here for in the you got product I got money go ahead right let's do something the yeah. less you know the better yeah the less you know the better like you got product I got money here's the business see he just all he he, you know what to expect with him. Um, and it's no surprise why he was successful as he was. But also Frank moving the family to New York. Um, just that scene with him and Ruby D. Yeah. Um, I just want to mention that just because that was a beautiful, powerful scene. And you don't get that side of, you know, you, you, it's hard to see Frank Lucas as a child and as somebody who was a victim of anything. It's mm-hmm. hard to picture him as that, but knowing that something happened, something horrific happened to his family in their home and one of his mother's most prized possessions and the fact that he realized that from memory because of the trauma properly, mm-hmm. had it rebuilt and gifted to it. That's got to be one of the best feelings you can do. Yeah. Not, so only, to- not only that, I agree with those scenes, but it's something about, I think that's every drug dealer, uh, basketball player, anyone once you hit that that money, a level of certain money, you got to get bombs together. <laughs> it's just, it yeah, is. I think that's anybody. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it, I don't care what your profession is. I think yeah. everybody's, you know, trying to reach for that. Uh, but I combine those two scenes. Brian, what you got? Um, A lot of what we've touched. Uh, one of my favorites is just the scene where Huey has the drugs in the car when they get pulled over by Trupo after Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. And Denzel drops the maybe next time it's your house that blows up line, which is just. <laughs> <laughs> phenomenal um and then just ends up going back in the car and beating the shit out of him for sure for having the drugs in the car is great man yeah. where does shelby at <laughs> shelby go <laughs> <laughs> um that's... Oh. go ahead go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, i'm just gonna move into my scene go ahead that's one of my favorite scenes in the movie because that's you true. don't see somebody like frank slipping Nope. Frank that's, that's he's, yeah, he, he's made a living off that. And just that look, even you know how terrifying it will have to be for somebody to be that calm all the time and he still shoots you a look that you know he's pissed off. Mm-hmm. That was still the most calm, angry look that I've ever seen because he knew right away, here comes Trupo, I got to get into it. Yeah. And even him looking, no one is dope in the trunk, the way he's looking away. Oh, Frank, why don't you come here real quick? Yeah, yeah, we've got. Like, he's still playing it off like it's no big deal. He yeah. controls the pace of everything. What are we going to do? Oh, we're going to shut that bag, shut the trunk, go home, have some apple pie. <laughs> yeah, apple cider, some pumpkin pie. Yeah, that's nothing. Wait, we, I'm already, you're already on payroll. I got enough money. I got I, I know the price of doing business. It is what it is. Right. And we don't see Frank lose his cool, obviously, unless people do dumb stuff, which I know there's another scene that we're going to bring up. Uh, yeah. But I love that. But Rachel, what you got? For sure. Uh, ironically enough, my next scene is. Frank and Huey at Smalls, where we see this is the top of Huey fucking up, okay? Mm-hmm. We got Huey talking to 
Cuba Gooding Jr. Um, Barnes. 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 Um, that's the start of it. Then he's in this loud ass suit again. Even though you've been separated from your brother for 15 years, if he's brought you into the game, he's already told you not to be loud, not to be seen, essentially. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so here is Huey doing his own thing, really kind of following the wrong crowd in school. You touched on it earlier. It was just another example of the dynamic between the two. I will shoot you. Nobody. Mm -hmm. The only reason that I haven't killed you is because you're my brother. He yeah. wasn't kidding. Like he meant that wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. And again, people who are always calm are insane. Yes. So, <laughs> if we didn't know it, then we for sure know it now. So again, I feel like when Frank kicked Huey's ass in the car after this major fuck up again, I feel like that had been brewing. Like your ass has literally been cruising for a bruising. So now here it go. Yep. <laughs> Agreed. Hey, can I, I just want to chime in real quick, Rachel. Yeah. I think more than anything, there was some disappointment about, oh, this is who my brother's become. Mm -hmm. mm. Like I'm more disappointed about you. You're attracted to somebody like uh, Nikki yeah. Barnes. Like mm -hmm. you're not stand up. You're not solid like me. Yeah, I still love you. I, you still got every quality I need to, to be my right hand man, from what I can tell. But now I got to put a little bit of an extra eye on you and make sure I pull you in closer. Like we don't do that. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. You are. You don't understand what we got going on. What I built. You are bringing all types of eyes by these loud clown suits. Like Nikki Barnes on the cover of I forget the Forbes. The, no, the New Yorker. It was like uh, some. Forbes. It was like a fake New York magazine. Yeah, it was like look like yeah. something, but yeah. It certainly yeah. wasn't Forbes, I can tell you that. We don't want nah, that it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> we don't uh -huh. want that kind of attention. But another thing that I love about that scene is seeing other other side of Frank when he mm -hmm. sees Ava. Just like, who was that? Yeah. You know, who was that? You know, you don't think about somebody that's that deep in a life having a family. When you own something, you can sell, you can call it what you want. You want to let my hand go. Just little small, slick comments that, mm -hmm. you know, going back to my table, you need somebody to come with you? Is that a yeah? Like, just that's cute. And the way Doc looked at him and had that nod, like, yeah, I haven't seen this before. Like, that's game is game. Game, game is game. game. <laughs> you know what I mean? my, boy, my boy out here working. He out here working. So I had to shout that out. I'm going to go with Frank Entertainment. So Frank is entertaining, and he has the Yankee scout there, introduces Steve there. You know, I'm a Lucas. I'm good enough on a bad day. Mm -hmm. you know, don't make it a bad day. Make it a good day. Mm -hmm. I think everybody's been in a setting like that where, you know, you're just trying to have a good time. I'm going to invite – I really should limit this guest list. Yeah. The life is good. I want everybody to enjoy this good energy that mm -hmm. I've been putting out. Everybody's eating. Everybody's happy. Yeah, probably gonna invite some people that probably shouldn't even be in this room. You're not qualified to be in this room with mm -hmm. some of the people that are here, but you can come anyway. And here you go, fucking up the party. Yep. Yeah, I off coke doing coke on my piano. I'm Frank Lucas, first of all. Go go to a side room. I got 15, 11, got 15, 11 rooms in this house. Yeah, but this ain't that kind of party. That goes back to his brothers once again, not. Uh, taking heed to anything that he's telling them, he's giving them game beyond beyond anything. They uh, he's giving them the game, and they're still not listening and doing dumb shit. Mm -hmm. So now I gotta act an ass, and and all you motherfuckers gotta go <laughs> straight I don't up. Know how, I don't know how good of a job the film did of, I guess, painting Frank Lucas as a businessman. I think they focus a lot on the drug dealer side, which is obviously how he made his income. Mm -hmm. But he's in the room with those people. He's getting the respect. There are certain people coming to his wedding because of the business side of things. He, I don't think Frank looks at himself as a drug dealer. But I think his brothers were still looking at him like that. Oh, you deal drugs? No, I'm I'm a CEO. Yeah, I have multiple businesses. I'm this. Like, I'm look at the room you're in. Yeah, you I know how to clean an alpaca rug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And shooting somebody is, I mean, everybody, anybody listening, if somebody shot somebody in your living room, you're going to go crazy. For yeah. sure. Like that's that's no questions asked. You deserve a physical conversation. You know what I mean? 
Absolutely. So the way he slammed his head in that piano goes back to that tango scene. This is the violent, crazy sociopath Denzel, or excuse me, Frank Lucas. And this is the following scene right after. He don't feel shit because he coked up all the motherfucking time. Right. And this is his cousin. So again. He ain't shit to me. It is. He ain't shit. He says, your driver get rid of Ain't no okay. But that's to school's point. Mm -hmm. Huey, little cuz, is your driver. Yep. Why don't you have control over this situation? Yep. And you're that's even right. still, why do I have to come and intervene? You're standing literally right here. I have to come from across the room to regulate. You're right here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. When you're the boss, you pay people to take care of your problems for you. Like I'm not reading, I'm not reading the reports. I expect you to read the report and tell me the important shit in it. Yep. Everything that I need to know. Like that's your job. It, it it's certain make my life easier. It's certain rules to this shit, and they should know when we step foot in in Frank's home, we just ain't doing that, bro. We just yeah. ain't we ain't doing that. Yeah. And that's what's crazy about it because I feel like everybody should know that. This ain't mm -hmm. the place for that. Like I People, you just know better. I'm just gonna keep it at that. I'm, I'm gonna get a little anecdotal. You said what? Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Hey. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Hey, hey, hey don't rub on that. This is twenty five thousand dollar pack. You block that shit. You don't rub it. I love that scene. That's one of my favorite quotes in the movie. Put the club soda on there. Simple Simon ass motherfuckers. <laughs> Anybody want to talk to me? You talk to Huey. Huey, you come to me. I'm never on the phone. All right. I take the goddamn sunglasses off. Take the goddamn sunglasses off. It's my scene, man. Denzel <laughs> killed that shit. Mm -hmm. All right, what you got next? Um, a personal favorite of mine because of like just the way it breaks down is when Eva gives him the chinchilla coat because <laughs> he's like everybody's received a gift that they don't want, but they can't <laughs> tell the other person that. Yeah, and he's like, "Oh yeah, it's great." Mm -hmm. And he's like, "You want me to wear it tonight?" And she's like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Yeah, I, I guess I'll fucking wear this stupid fucking coat tonight." <laughs> and then the snowball that happens from that from yeah. that coat with Trupo, and when he gets done after the wedding, going and and burning it, I think those scenes tied together are a couple a couple of my favorites too. Yeah, the, uh, my favorite, not to cut in, but my favorite part of all of that is even though he doesn't want to wear it, he still stunts in it. When, when uh, I can't remember who said something to him, like, how'd, how'd you get in front of me? Or nice jacket, uh, uh, you bought it. Like, just, yeah. <laughs> just, just flexing. Like, knowing damn well he ain't want that shit on. Yeah. Um, my scene is the Ali fight uh, for all of those reasons that you named, Brian. It's so crazy. And I was going to say this earlier, but Frank Lucas's downfall is literally because of everyone else. Yes. Mm -hmm. There was not a mistake that he made other than trusting people, yep. other than bringing people in. That was his only ish misstep. He got questionable when he went back over to, to Nam once shit was already hot. But um, you're at the fight in this cult that you know that you would never be caught dead in mm -hmm. anyway, but trying to make your wife happy, who again, and you've been with him long enough. You know who he is. You know what his style is. Even if you wanted to get him a fur coat, gift him with his own money, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Why would it be something gaudy like that? Get a nice black, something that will blend in with what everybody else has on. And then you got the nerve to have this hat too. Like, yeah. you yeah. asking to be outed, you know? And he Isn't knows. It? That. That's the same thing he got on Huey about is about being too visible. Yes. And I am literally calling all eyes to me. We're in front of all these big wigs. I'm with Joe Lewis. He stops Ali on his way to the ring to introduce us, mm -hmm. which I know it's a movie, but I'm watching Godfather of Harlem. That kind of confused me, but whatever. Um, so it just was a lot. And again, to your point, the snowball of all of these effects now. Uh, Stunting. No, you're right, though, with touching on 
everybody else around him fucked up and he did try to do everything right. And the thing is, is like, you want to try to keep your circle small in that situation. Mm -hmm. And he was still trying to do that with his family. Yep. And it still ended up not working out. Yeah. yeah. That, that was everybody the, can't go. That yeah. was the smartest okay. thing he did was, was to contact his family and bring them in. You know, who can you trust if not family? At least that's what you think, you know? So the family got him caught up. That, mm -hmm. Exactly. It doesn't. My, exactly. exactly. To my, oh, excuse me, to, to your point with that, Frank Lucas, as described, you know, by Ridley Scott, mm -hmm. when, by Steve Zion, who was who wrote the film, when they met with him, they described him as a sociopath. And I think you have to be that way to be successful, to be a Frank Lucas. Like, there's only, not everybody's built for that mm -hmm. and what it really takes. Like, they were asking him about, so were you nervous about going over to Bangkok to go get it? He said, no, he, he couldn't that. comprehend what that meant. Like, nervous for what? Like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. Why would I be nervous to do that? When the average person is thinking, like, I'm not going to the jungle to get heroin to fly back on American military airlines. Like, he right. like, never registered his mind. Well, are you afraid of certain situations? Afraid? Like, huh? And every time I hear that, every time I hear him describe like that, it makes me think of you got to be a special type of different to last in this game and really be successful. Yep. And Rachel, it just made me think of you know the point you made of everybody else around them, they ain't built like that. So, of course, you're going to bring them down. He's He could have done everything and slept like a baby. It's surprising, like I said earlier, that he even had a wife, that he had a family. See, I'm not surprised he had a wife and a family. Gangsters always have wives and families that they love and cherish. Like, that's not surprising to me. But I do wonder if he would have been better off Instead of bringing his family in, again, you've been gone for 15 years. You don't know them people like that. You oh. can contact, y'all can talk as much as every week because it sounds like it's 1968. You're not calling long distance that often. Again, it's a pay phone. You know what I'm saying? We got to make plans to talk to the family. So you are getting updates. You're not dealing with them on the ins and outs. So I said Frank didn't make any mistakes, but maybe this is his mistake because I wonder what his success level would have been or how much further he could have gone or gotten if he only dealt with people who were already in Bumpy's network versus bringing his own mm. family in who don't know the game, who don't know the ins and outs, who are prone to becoming addicted to the product. You know what I'm saying? Whereas Buffy is disciplined. Y'all are not. I... He's the oldest. Y'all might not remember the trauma that whatever happened when they lost everything. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You might not have even been born. So you don't know. So that struggle. And yes, you live in Greensboro. You're in the country. But that life is not the same as the life he has lived, let alone being under Bumpy's tutelage for 15 years. Now, see, I, I agree with everything you're saying, but I think he, he made his point of why he didn't go that route because he said Bumpy thought he owned his business, but he really didn't. No, I'm not talking about dealing with the Italians. Okay, okay. He was Bumpy's driver. There were other people who worked for Bumpy. You know, okay. he was the driver. So who else was your top man? Who else did you maybe cut out in order to bring your family in and give them these high positions and turn them on to the game? Right, right. Okay. Fair. That's fair. My next scenes, I'm just going to highlight a couple of them just dealing with the rise of Frank Lucas. One is the meeting with Dominic, the conversation about dairy farmers. You know, I'm thinking about them just as much as they ever thought about me. Just showing that Frank is the guy. I'm the I'm the connect. Like, you have to come to me. You're paying 75, 80 a key. I'm going to sell them to you for 50. You work for me now just to settle. You know, they look at us like we're to help. Like, they look at me like I'm Santa, like it's Christmas and I'm Santa Claus. Throwing a cigar in front of his face. Just an ultimate boss move by Frank. Like, I run this whole city. Like, New York, New Jersey, everywhere you can think of, we're expanding out. Um, 
Obviously, that leads into his wedding, which Trupo stops him. Trupo wants his taste. Another great performance by Josh Brolin. And just the emphasis of, I'm purposely stopping you now to fuck up your day. I could catch you tomorrow. I could catch you the day after that. I want you to know I'm on your radar. I'm you special. Me 10K. I'm special. I'm special. Yeah. It says right walking here. Around, walking around a $50,000 chinchilla, and you haven't even bought me a cup of coffee. <laughs> Once again, he has a certain fuck you about him. Like I, oh, he does. Yeah, are you talking to? Mm-hmm. Um, and then that going into the Thanksgiving sequence, Trupo's car getting blown up. That was a real reaction from Josh Brolin. Ridley Scott did not tell him that the car was about to blow up. So when you see him flinch, mm-hmm. um, that's one hundred percent genuine. Um, and even Frank and Steve, you know, I want what you want, Uncle Frank. You know, I want what you got. Just yeah. that ultimate level of I've made it, and we'll. I'll I'll emphasize this more when we get to Dominic and and Frank's conversation about success. Um, But I made it to a certain point where Nas had a lyric once where he said, look at this house, look at this big house, this Porsche paid for by crime in reference to talking about Scarface. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm watching Scarface, why would I not want to be that? Like, why would I not want to get into crime? That means I'm going to have a Ferrari and this big mansion and everything else. My uncle is getting it like that. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be in a family business, bro. Like you making it. I don't see you with no guns. You got you on the top top. I know I can get in with you or where you at. Yeah. And be safe and really run this. I don't want to play ball no more. What are you talking about? And like the ball players wish they had your type of money. Yeah, and if you him, all you see is the, the benefits. You don't see that other part. So of course, yeah, hell yeah, that's what I want. Wanna be like you, huh? <laughs> and Frank and Frank sees that what I just said earlier. Mm-hmm. You're not even built like me to do this. I can do this because I'm me. Yeah. I'm built for this. So all of that built in. Uh, Brian, what you got next? I think we've touched on most of mine. Um, yeah, I'm good. Rachel? Yeah, we, we've touched on most of mine too, but um, I guess I'll go. Obviously, Frank's house getting raided um, by Trupo. And then coming out of that is once... Um, Frank and Ruby D, his mother, are talking. You know, if you would have been a doctor, they would have been doctors. If yeah, that's you was a great was disappointed um, mother, you know what I'm saying? Because now here is this life, even though she knew, you knew that he wasn't totally, totally on the up and up. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it was cool when y'all were eating high off the hog, but now that it's tough, you got to go back home. Like, now you mad. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have it both ways, but that was just a really powerful uh, scene. And, and it's true because even though he didn't know them like that, they still admired him. And yeah. just we talked several times now about how different he was than them. Of course, you want to follow in his footsteps. Yeah. That Ruby D scene is. That Ruby D scene is probably what that's the nomination scene, I would, I would imagine. That's what yeah. they showed on the real. Mm-hmm. There's nothing like a, there's only certain things a mom can say to you. For sure. You know, especially mother son. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're somebody as powerful as like Frank Lucas, you know, just kind of let you know, I've never asked you about any of this. Mm-hmm. I knew what was going on, but I ain't saying nothing. I never want to see you lie to me in your face, but even I know you don't shoot a cop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ava knows that. Only everybody knows that except for you. Just that, yo, what are you doing? Um, I love that scene as well. I got a couple that I'll go through real quick. One I wanted to talk about just because it's probably my favorite scene in the movie. Uh, Frank and Nikki Barnes, obviously, just because classic. Comedy. Also, the classic blue magic scene. Yes. Um, Frank wasn't playing about his shit. Period. Nikki, Nikki said, if I, buy, "If I buy something, no, I own it." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if, I, if I buy a car, I want to paint the motherfucker. I can paint it. <laughs> I uh, the raid scene when they actually catch up with them and you know run into the projects. That's obviously got to be on there. Um, Frank and Richie when they finally meet for the first time, coming out those church steps to them talking into the courtroom and making the deal, the whole nine. Uh, but more importantly, I want to talk about Frank and Dominic. That's my favorite scene of the movie. Mm -hmm. That is the ultimate, um, is it all worth it? Like, what are we even doing this for? Mm -hmm. The journey versus the end result type of conversation. Uh, 
you're shooting at your wife, which is crazy. Obviously, I want blood. I want blood. You're shooting at me, you're shooting at my wife, trying to kill us. I'm coming from people's head too. So I'm going to the person that told me you're going to guarantee me peace of mind. Who did it? I need names. Oh, you don't have anything for me. How about I put everybody I know with a gun on the street and we just start shooting shit up? Yep. Right. And the way Dominic looked at him, like success took a shot. Mm-hmm. You know, it was it was some guy that you slided that you didn't even know. It was somebody that you forgot to pay. You know, it was a junkie. Mm-hmm. It was somebody you put out of business. Naming right. all of these reasons, like, bro, look at what you have. Yes. What makes you think that you're untouchable? What makes you think that people aren't starving and want what you have out here? Want to hold that spot? Um, Jay Z, ironically, this American gangster. Uh, we'll talk about it in the soundtrack section. But he once had an interview talking about it's not me; it's the spot that I hold that people are. Mm-hmm. And whoever's in the spot is going to get this heat. Yeah. They're, they're going to get this, uh, you know, criticism, whatever you want to call it. Bro, open your eyes. You can be successful and have enemies, or you can be unsuccessful and have friends. Yeah, I mean that was just a bar, and that's just how life works. Where once you get to a certain point, Back. I always say, I mean, there's no such thing as a good billionaire. No. Um, but I love that scene. I love that scene. It's just the way they knocked everything down. But I think that's about it. Like I said, the ending of the movie, we got the whole. It, it had a perfect arc. You know, we went up the roller coaster, went down. Mm-hmm. I think that's it for scenes. Best quotes. Anybody got some that they want to put out? Uh, we've said all of them for the most part, so I'll just do a few. What's wrong with y'all niggas? I never seen Coochie before. Uh, the loudest one in the room is the weakest one in the room. And hey, don't rub that shit. It's twenty five thousand dollar alpaca. You block that shit. You know, simple Simon. My mother says that all the time. This mm-hmm. simple Simon, such and such. <laughs> I love that too, Brian. You got anything? Um. Dental yelling call an ambulance is <laughs> internally in my mind like one of the greatest things of all time. And anytime I see an ambulance, I think of him yelling, call the ambulance. Um, in that same scene, Bumpy saying you can't find the heart of anything, pause to stick the knife, which is just an awesome, awesome quote. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, I've blot that shit. The loudest one in the room is the weakest one in the room. Um, but yeah, th- those are all the classics. Uh, I have every single one you guys named. Uh, I also added one ma- <laughs> more important than one man's life is order. Uh, and just one that I love is I'm a busy man, cousin and no cousin. I ain't got time to go to no funerals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a classic scene as well. I got everything you guys said. Obviously my man is a classic. My man. Um, <laughs> hey, also has a classic gift. Multiple classic gifts. I want to shout that out. This film has multiple of those. Mm-hmm. And I think the one line that summed up Richie the best um, is one of my favorite quotes. Do you really care about this, or do you just not want to? Do you just not want her to win ever? Yeah, uh, Rachel. That ties back to what you told me earlier about it's not necessarily his morals. It's just a certain thing in him that that's what drives him. It's not doing the right thing. It's I just don't want you to win. Like mm-hmm. I'm not playing with that toy, but I don't want you to play with it either. Mm-hmm. He's that kind of guy. Say still. My answer is clear, but I want to hear what you guys have. School, what you got? I got Josh Brolin. Ray P? Same. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And that's crazy to say because she will tell the jewel for Ruby D. Yeah. You got some strong performances, but Josh Brolin killed it. Mm-hmm. Chiwetel tell was my second just because um, his eyes are piercing. And he does a lot of facial, uh, I don't say facial acting, but his face and using those. There's big... good reactions from him. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I, I would Absolutely. say second, I have Idris Alba as Tango. And he's, he's has what, three full scenes and each one it's like, this dude's a motherfucker too. And you know, his last scene is, as we talked about, a great scene. But it's, yeah, he's he's probably second for me. I'm not you know who I wish was in this movie more? Who? Common. Joe Morton. Okay. Who? who? Joe Morton. I wish he was in this uh, film more. Can we can we talk about Joe Morton in this movie for a second? And the mustache? Why does he look like Dave Chappelle playing a white guy in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what he looks like too. It does. I don't, I don't know what they were going for. I don't even know who he, he was supposed to play. That was my um, whole thing. I was going to ask, like who, who is he in relation to everybody in this movie? 
Man, that's a good question. Somebody comfortable guy. enough to come up on Christmas. Yeah. He was Bumpy's guy. Yeah, I was going to say, I think he was Bumpy's guy because he, Denzel, uh, excuse me, Frank Lucas definitely told him there's a lot of people that owe Bumpy some money in this room and, and I'm planning on getting it. Well, he also tells Frank Lucas, he's like, Bumpy wanted me to let you know, like, that for you to want for nothing. So, like, I was like, all right, so who is this guy? What is mm-hmm. his, what's his deal? They didn't do a great job of actually telling us who that was. And yeah, granted, this movie originally was like three and three hours and 20 minutes. So they trimmed it down to two hours and 36. Um, there is an extended version on DVD. It doesn't really show you anything significant or that's going to change the movie for you. Uh, but it is a pretty long movie. So I wonder how much stuff left on the cutting room floor. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, and should I say on the those are the these are the those are the moments where I'm like, damn, I would like to see this as a as a mini series or a, right, you know what I mean, like for shit like that for sure. Yeah, I can see that. Things that bother you. I'll go. I think for me, and maybe again, it's not necessarily related, but it is. But I've watched all seasons of Godfather of Harlem, mm-hmm. and. It's more of a things that bother me in relation to that. So in Godfather of Harlem, Frank is not one of Bumpy's guys. And so now I wonder if that's maybe a licensing thing um, or I don't know, maybe just didn't approve his likeness for that. But for what we know of Frank Lucas to have been to Bumpy, that is just bizarre to me and again i've already said it like what bothers me is that his takedown was basically everybody else's fault that's that makes it worse like Mm -hmm. so i'm with you i'm with you ray p i'm on season three i believe of uh godfather of harlem and i expected from season one like to see some frank lucas Lucas. right never get that so so all right Maybe that's because there's some discrepancy about how close Frank and Bumpy were. Mm. There's been a long standing feud between Bumpy Johnson's wife and Frank Lucas about what's true and what's not true. For example, Frank Lucas says he was there with Bumpy Johnson when he died, which it wasn't in an appliance store, it was at a restaurant. Okay. Um, Frank Lucas, Lucas, excuse me, Bumpy's wife said Frank wasn't there at all. He died in one of his best friends, his childhood friend's arms. Right? Frank wasn't even there. Frank wasn't his driver, which has been proven as a fact. If he might have driven around a couple of times, but there was a period of time, I think, between 63 and 68 when Bumpy was locked up. So just the right. math itself showed that he couldn't have been his driver for 15 years. And his wife called Frank Lucas a flunky. He said he's a flunky. He was around. Like, he wasn't nobody in the room to pay attention to. He was a little guy, pretty much. <laughs> That's what she, so there's a lot of dis- For real, there's a lot of discrepancy about what's real and what's not. So I, uh, when you see... I forget what it was exactly. It might have been something with the BET show, American Gangster. Mm-hmm. It was something to do with Frank Lucas. Um, and they couldn't do it because it, it had to go through Bumpy Johnson's wife. Got it. And she's mm-hmm. accused him of lying. So I don't know who's telling the truth. That's his wife. Why would she lie? But Frank Lucas, why would he lie? It's one of those type of things. Okay. So that might be part of it. Well, there we go. That's what bothers me. <laughs> Brian, you got anything? I mean, little things, like I said, Joe Morton looking like Dave Chappelle playing a white guy. Um, the scene where Denzel's wearing those disguises when he's handing out the the blue magic, like every time I watch the movie, I'm like, he doesn't need to do that. Mm-hmm. It, it's little stupid things like that that drive me crazy in movies. Um, I think that's it. Like this, again, I can't stress enough how much I enjoy this movie, you know, from start to finish. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I thought we were going to say Cuba. I think he's fantastic in this. I'll, he I'll cracks my shit up. Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't think he's acting in a lot of it. I think this is how he feels like. I think like this is how Cuba Gooding Jr. is when he goes out. I think so, too. I just saw that video of him breakdancing at some party. Right. Like, right. He's a good time. Yeah, yeah. yeah Cuba Wild Dude, man. Cuba Wild Dude. He's Shout out to the goodies. Yeah. He's definitely my second uh, for scene stiller. I had Cuba Gooding Jr. right behind Josh Brolin, so I'm with you. Cuba was Cuba that's another person. Amazing. That's another person I would have. It's another person I would have liked to see more of in the movie, mm-hmm. for sure, for sure. 
Any actors from The Wire, Idris Elba, Russell Stringer Bell, of course. Soundtrack. Um, I know a lot of people associate Jay-Z's American Gangster with the film. It was obviously motivated from the film when he saw an early screening, but it is not the soundtrack of the film. Mm-hmm. The official soundtrack actually was nominated for a Grammy for Best Soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to highlight the people. There is an actual soundtrack. There's Anthony Hamilton's um, song is on there. One of my I love that song. I love that song. Love the fact that he was in the movie, got to perform it. They brought that whole 70s type of energy, 60s, 70s. Um, wouldn't let that happen to me. I didn't have anything personally. Is anybody? No. That's that million dollars. Yeah, I'm not turning into a million dollars. We all covered that. I think, hold on, back, yeah, to, we, the sound, back to the soundtrack. Um, the score for this movie is really good. It's really good. Yeah, it really is. Um, they, I feel like they may rely on it too much. It has that thing where it's like in Avengers Endgame and Infinity War, they play like different versions of the Avengers theme, and I feel mm-hmm. like they do that in this movie with it. But it's it's a solid score. Yeah, yeah, I can agree with that. Do we have any trivia school? Um, I did not, but bro, it was so much that I didn't really find too much interesting. So. No. Yeah, there's a lot of small stuff if we wanted to write a book report and yeah. tell it to y'all. Um, there were a couple of things that I thought were just interesting. In real life, Melvin Combs, Puff's father, was a Frank Lucas' driver. Mm-hmm. They didn't portray it in the film, but that happened in real life. Richie Roberts, for all his uh, morality, or lack thereof, for turning in a million dollars, later was convicted of uh, was a conspiracy or money fraud, something like that. He was pretty mm-hmm. much Conning people, some of his clients, out of twenty thousand dollars. He was disbarred. That's he hilarious. was disbarred in I think 2019, 2015, somewhere around there. He was disbarred and had to go on four years of probation. So what are the odds? Mm-hmm. And Frank Lucas, you know, they obviously said that he served, he got 70 years, served 15. He actually did those in two stints. He was released after I think five years and then ended up violating his parole and went back to jail for another time. Richie Roberts really did defend him. He really is the godfather of one of his children. It's an odd situation, but whatever. Which is weird. Yeah, the last thing was, it was actually DEA agent Lou Rice who debriefed Lucas and could um, convince him to flip. It was not Richie Roberts who did that. Mm-hmm. Both Richie Roberts and Frank Lucas said that they are, you know, a lot of the film is not true. Richie Roberts had issues with the fact that he never, he doesn't even have a child, but he was portrayed as having a custody battle. <laughs> Um, just being a total piece of shit, Dad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, damn, yeah, bro, I'm still a real person. Like, people go look at me on the street. Like, I ain't shit. I ain't got kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and Frank Lucas, who knows, man? I've heard Frank Lucas say some wild shit. So, I'm kind of siding with Mrs. Bumpy Johnson. Yeah. Uh, maybe Frank. Frank is the last man. Well, he, R.I.P. to him. Um, but for a long time, I'd have been one of the last men living and being able to tell the story and the narrative. I lie our conversation on the Temptations episode about Otis. Yeah. It's my story. Nobody else is here to debunk it. Yep. We get to the end of the episode. We'll rate the film. The average viewer rates American Gangster 7.8 out of 10. Mm. Ray P, we'll start with you. Too high, too oh. low, just right. Too low, I'm going to go 8.5. Mm. Mm-hmm. School, what you got? I'm going to go too low. I'm going to go 8.3. Right. Okay, so this is something I was going to bring up. I remember this movie not being as popular as reviews I've recently read of it. And always wondering why this movie didn't do better and why people don't like this movie more. Um, mm-hmm. So you saying, what'd you say it was? Seven what? 7.8. Yeah, that's too low. Um, I'm going to go like eight seven eight eight. Hmm. I'm going to go 8 4. Okay. You sandwich right in between school to Rachel. Okay. Um, real quick, just because I know it's a personal favorite of yours, Brian, I just want to ask you uh, American Gangster or The Departed? <sighs> oh, man. <laughs> the Departed. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's close. It's, it's close. But mm-hmm. The Departed just has everything that I love in a movie. Yes. And American Gangster has like three-fifths of it. Um, Still 
I'll put American Gangster in my top 10, top 15. Um, Depart is on my top five, top three, maybe. Okay. Fair, fair. Well, Brian, we appreciate you uh, taking the time. Oh, hold on. Go ahead. Are we going to have that training day combo? Oh, I kind of know the answer from oh. them. But, um, <laughs> yeah, just how much they love the film. There's, I don't, there wasn't really a point in having it because I think they're strongly on the side of American Gangster. I'm, I'm personally on the side of Train Today. Okay. Um, so wait, wait. All right. No, so hold on, real quick. Hold on, real quick. Real quick. Real quick. My bad. My bad. You're right. My bad. School. This is when you get into what's the difference between the better film versus the more enjoyable film. Like which film am I watching first, or which one is actually better? It might be two different conversations. But if I'm, you can only watch one of these movies, and the other one does never existed. I'm picking Train Today. I'm picking Train Today, like easily. It's not even close for me. I agree. I'm not. If you ask me, if you ask me which one's the better film, and I'm saying American Gangster, mm -hmm. it's the better film, better quality film, better storytelling. But just I'm with the shits, and I just want to be entertained. I, I love Out of Time. Like I'm personally an Out of Time fan. Like I put Out of Time. Above a lot of movies, people wouldn't put it above with when it comes to Denzel. That's my personal list. The yeah. movies list is different, so it's an interesting combo. But Train the Day, that that I'm watching that ten times before I watch American Gangster, and I love American Gangster. Yeah, I'm with you. I yeah, I'm with you. I think Train the Day. What Denzel did in Train the Day was just. Yeah, and and the timing of it, just that man, we never saw anything like that from Denzel. It's just man, it's a it's a moment in history, <laughs> for sure. Yes, at the time it was, but is it now just like a ridiculous parody of itself? <laughs> of him no, just screaming sense. King Kong and got shit on me. Like has has it just become too overblown in the what 22 years since it's it's been released like i don't think so <clears throat> denzel okay. so maybe because i go back to 2001 every time i watch it yeah it could be a part of the problem no i love like ah oh, i love that movie yeah. i've got i've got to rewatch it i haven't seen it in probably five or six years and After don't get me wrong it, make sure you check out the culture garden episode <laughs> i enjoy it i enjoy the movie i think it's i think it's good um I Maybe because there's... it also has the benefit of being an hour 40 versus two and a half. Mm -hmm. Sitting down for two and a half hours, as good as this movie is. Can be challenging. There's some stuff you're going to miss because you got some other shit to get to. Mm -hmm. two, hour, two and a half hours straight is a, it's a I don't want to call it a task, but it's, it can be a lot. <laughs> hmm. yeah, right. I'll get back to you guys. Yeah, I'm not angry. If anybody says American Gangster is better, I'm not going to debate them. But me personally, training today. So, Brian, we appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you. No, it was great. I appreciate you guys. It will not be the last one. Um, school, Ray P. You guys already know what it is. Thank you. Thank you as always. As always. Thank you to thank you to the film. Thank you to the actors, to everybody involved, American Gangster, for giving us uh, the medium to even have this conversation. Classic. We've said everything we can say about it. Thank you to everybody out there watching, listening. We can't do any of this without you. We appreciate y'all. Once again, we got y'all. We'll be back this weekend at some point. Rap shit. Sure. Check that out. School's Guilty Pleasure. We'll be dropping next Thursday on Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, we will not have a Culture Garden episode, but that will serve as some content for everybody. And we'll be back the last week of December and going strong for the last four weeks of the year before we take the last week off. So, uh, we appreciate y'all. Thank you. Y'all be cool. How y'all be cool? Peace. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>